Hi guys. <laughs> so before we start anything, I have a task for you all, for anyone who's watching. So if you go into your profile, there's this thing called an organization. And well, there's this organization that like needs more members. Um, it's called Second Thread Fan Club. And basically, uh, it, it's like self-evident what it does. So you guys should all join it. And if you don't know how to join an organization, basically you can go to settings and then go to social. And then you can just paste this in. And in fact, I will paste it into the chat right now. And then that will let you do everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, and with everything else, I will do the standard thing of manually doing this myself. Should work. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, you guys should all join this because it's a very um, it's a very wholesome cause to be able to support. So anyway, um, yeah, apart from that, I'm going to be doing, well, it's another topic stream. Today we're doing constructives because I am not good at those, so it should make for high entertainment value to watch me uh, do not very well. Uh, I think that should be interesting. Let's see. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly great at constructives either. That's kind of the, it's kind of the idea to brush up on your weaknesses. Okay. As always, I'll put this in and okay. There's not really like much to introduce here. It's just kind of constructives are basically more on the ad hoc side of things, where you have some condition and you want to maybe construct some answer that satisfies it, for example. So I don't think there's that great a way to practice them. I mean, some of them require understanding of concepts like, um, like for example, graph theory, where some constructive problems are based entirely on graphs. But in the in most of the cases, constructives are going to be sort of in their own like field. I So what I'm saying is there isn't much of an intro I can do for this. It's just sort of um, doing whatever you can to try and come up with something smart. OK, um, how am I? I'm doing pretty well so far. Should be an interesting stream. Don't think my sleep has been optimal lately, so that would mean that it'll be harder for me to solve things, which I think should be more interesting. Uh, Lee algorithm? No, I'm not sure what that is. <clears throat> All right, anyway. So yeah, let's just like do this, because I have nothing better to do. Um, I will get everything set up. OK, problem A. In the beginning of the new year, Kayvon wanted to, Kayvon, yeah, Kayvon decided to reverse his name. He doesn't like palindrome, so he changed um, something to Navik. Navik to Navik? Sure. He's too selfish, so for a given n, he wants to obtain a string of n characters, each of which is either a, b, or c, with no palindromes of length 3 appearing, appearing in the string as a substring. For example, the strings ABC and ABCA suit him, while the string ABA doesn't. He also wants the number of letters C in his string to be as little as possible. So it's only at length 3, specifically. OK, so let's like um, wait. close this and get a new one. Let's like figure out what happens when we put a few characters down. Um, for example, so we put down an A, and then we put down, for example, another A. 
then if the third character was to be another A, then we would have a pound drum length 3. So that's not possible. So the next character has to be either B or C. But in either of these cases, okay, so now we've handled the first three characters. We know the first three characters are now a, are not a pound drum. But now what we have to do is we have to put down the next character. And we have to handle the next three characters. So if our next characters are either B or C, well, we can't have an A again, because if we do, then we're going to have a pound drum. It has to be anything but A. So in either of these cases, we can put down either a B or a C, and it'll be fine. And then here, now we can follow, now we know that these three characters are good, so now we're following the next chain of three characters, specifically this one. And it's the same idea here. We can put down anything that doesn't make it a palindrome. So for example, here, we can't put down B, but we can put down something like A. Here, we can't put down B. And um, so it can be A or C, basically anything but B. And so we sort of get this process of the next character, like this character, for example, is fixed based on these two characters. Right? But like, we can do better than that. Because, essentially, um, like consider, consider what it means for a string to be a palindrome of length 3. We have three characters, um, x, y, and z. And so, if we reverse it, then we get a string z, y, and x. Which is to say, z becomes an x's position, and vice versa, and y stays in y's position. So in fact, it doesn't matter what y is, because no matter what, it's going to be in the same position as itself. So what we really care about is that x is not equal to z, which means that if we sort of extend this over all palindrome or over all substrings of length three, it means that no no characters that are two apart from each other can be the same. So if we put down a, then we don't. If we put down a, then we can like have this be b, for example. And then this character, by this condition, has to be not equal to this a. So we can make it something like b. And then this character, by this condition, has to be not equal to, has to, be not equal to b. So we can um, have this be a. Oh, I did forget to pin the question. That's true. I always forget to do that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, so the mashup link, you can find it here. I can also um, put it in this comment. Like so. Now I can actually remember to pin it. Like so. Right. But now, say we want to put down this character. By our condition, it has to not be equal to this. So we may as well make it A. And then we want to put down this character. By our condition, it must not be equal to this. So we can put down B. And basically, um, Yeah, that's it. You can sort of uniquely determine any character from the character two positions before it. So it just has to be not equal to that. So there are like, in like, uh, not even like, it's like an exponential possible number of constructions you can do here. Um. Oh, I didn't even read this part. He also wants the number of letters C in his string to be as little as possible. But that's like perfect, right? Like we we don't we yeah we don't actually need any C's because here we just need this to be not equal to A, which means we can have this be B, for example. Here we just need this to be not equal to B, which means this can be A, for example, and so on. So we get this sort of alternating pattern on even characters. We have A, and then this character must not be equal to A, so we have B, and then A, and then B, and so on. And on odd characters, the same thing happens. We start with B, then we do A, then we do B, then we do A, and that goes on until the end. Because no, we have the condition satisfied. No substring of length 3 is a palindrome, which is cool. And at the same time, we minimize the number of Cs and that we don't use any at all. So that's great.
And actually, I think there's an even easier construction. We can do something like A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, etc. <coughs> we just like shift all these characters by one. It's the same principle. Yeah, it should just work, I believe. So the convenient thing to do is to just like totally ignore the length of the string and just basically generate this until some huge number because this is really easy to generate. Um, so for example, like this. So basically we're going to generate this string up to 200,000 characters and then for our answer we'll just print a prefix of it because it really doesn't matter what we do. But it's it sort of helps us avoid thinking about indexing at all. We just like, because the string's going to work no matter what. We just need to make sure it's the right length. Uh, that is not what I meant to do. Wait, how does this work? How does substar work? Because clearly it's not that. Okay. Yeah, A, A, and A, B. Uh, let me see. What did I miss in chat? Being good at constructors has got a lot to do with one, one's background. Well, that's partially true. Like, if you're inherently better at puzzle solving and stuff like that, it could definitely be easier, sort of pattern recognition. But you can you can train yourself to be good at constructives. It's still possible to do that. Um, at length four becomes a palindrome. Yeah, but that's fine because the problem doesn't care about that. Um, I said I was not good at constructives. Well, okay, this one. This one, the difficulty is like incredibly low. So for this, I should be able to solve this one. If I if I can't solve this one, that's like scary. Is there any specific way to train for that? Well, it's just sort of like practicing constructives, to be honest. Like if you if you do a lot of the thing you're trying to get good at, then it will help you be good at it. There's a lot of background noise going on. Is this annoying? I hope it's not. Oh yeah, by the way, there's a whole um, playlist of topic streams. Wait, let me find this. This should be simple. Like, there's just this whole um, playlist thing. Actually, I can open the playlist it itself. Much. Then instead of this being... And then play my own voice, apparently. Yeah, so here are the previous topic streams. Uh, let me just make sure I didn't screw up that link. Yeah, there we go. Oh, no background noise? Awesome. Okay, it's like really loud for me. So, whatever. I guess that's good. Yeah, I watch Shikaru. I'm already subbed to him, so I don't think it's that big of a secret. <laughs> All right. We have problem B, and I'm going to remember to pin this now. I'm going to remember to do it. When you suggest one. Uh, if this stream doesn't go on for that long, then I may take um, suggestions, just to like make it go on a bit longer. I do also have a couple that I want to try. Like, for example, this problem called binary table that you've all heard about, I'm sure. I want to try to just like implement that because I've heard it's terrible. So let's see. I want to see how that goes, but only if the stream doesn't go on too long initially. Okay. Let s of x be sum of digits in the decimal representation of positive integer x. Given two integers n and m, find some positive integers a and b such that s of a is greater than or equal to n. S of b is also greater than or equal to n, but s of a plus b is less than or equal to m. Okay, um, both numbers must not contain leading zeros and must have like no more than 2230. Okay, so what does this mean?
That's an A plus B. Okay, so like these constraints are kind of weird, but something important here is that like this is less, double this is less than this, so maybe that's significant. Um, let's see. So we want two numbers. So like they're kind of, um, let's see. There are kind of two things a digit can do. Like let's say you add two numbers together. Either a plus b is less than 10, in which case c is equal to a plus b, or a plus b is like greater than or equal to 10, in which case c is equal to a plus b minus 10. And this is sort of like obvious just how caring works, but like what happens is if this part is true, then we sort of get like smaller numbers. And that's what we want, right? We want the sum of the we want the sum of the digits of the individual numbers to be as large as possible, but we don't want um, like we don't want um. We don't, sorry, we don't want the sum to be large, which means we want to do as, as many of these minus 10s as possible. So we want, so in a sense, we want the digits to cancel out. Because if they do, then we will get a small sum of digits of the sum, but these digits can be sort of whatever we want. How do we make them cancel out? Let's say we start with two numbers, for example, 5 and 5. And then we get this number 10 as their sum. And that's cool, but it's like not good enough. Here we get something like, um, we get 5 and 5 as the two sums. Here we get 1 as a two sum, or 1 as a sum, which is good. Again, we want these to be large and this to be small. So let's put on another digit. For example, we can put on any digit that will also cancel, which means that these digits sort of have to sum to 9 now, because we want them to cancel with this 1. So let's, for example, we can put down like 1 and 8, or 2 and 7, or 4 and 5, because that makes these numbers like as close together as they want. Although it doesn't really matter in the long run, I think. So then we get 9 plus 1, so these cancel again. And now we have, um, whoa, what was that? And now we have 100. So now this sum is 9. This sum is 9, this sum is 10, and this is still 1. Because we still cancel as much as possible, meaning we get this to be low and the other ones to be high. And so now, like, what's stopping us from just continuing this? Let's just put on another 4 and another 5. Now this increases by 4, this increases by 5, and this stays like a power of 10. So we still have this sum of digits to be 1. So that means that for any m, the sum will be less than it because m is greater than or equal to 1. And we can sort of make these as, we can make these s of a and s of b as big as we want. Because no matter what happens, the sum of digits of the sum is still going to be 1. So to generalize, the strategy would just be to like put two 5s down on the end, then put a ton of 4s here, or something like that. And then on this one, put a ton of 5s down. I suppose that would work. And I think actually it doesn't even depend on the input because it shouldn't depend on the input because like no matter what we can make these larger than any possible n and we can make this smaller than any possible m. So um, that's just like kind of it. We can totally ignore the input. Uh, Um, s plus equals 4. Oh, actually, we can do even better. Um,
cache. I'm not um, for debugging purposes. I'm just gonna like make this not a thousand because that would be painful to look at. It doesn't really matter what the input is. Perfect. And of course, the the length is not twenty two thirty, so that should be fine. Yeah, so it's interesting that these kind of problems just don't depend on the input at all. Because this solution will work for all possible inputs, no matter what it is. So we don't care about the input because we're not tailoring the solution to work for any specific input. I think there are more problems like that. It's kind of cool like that. Okay, so that concludes B. Now we can get, oh, that's fun. Now we can get on to C, and I will once again do the mashup thing. No, oh, wait. Uh, what? C. And pin, as always. As soon as it works, cool. You are given a four times four grid. You play a game, there's a sequence of tiles, each of them is either two times one or one times two. Your task is to consequently place all tiles from the given sequence in the grid. When a tile is placed, each cell which is located in a fully occupied Um, sequence of, wait, 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 what? Each cell which is located in a fully occupied row or column is deleted. Cells are deleted at the same time independently. You can place tile in the grid at any position. The only condition is that tile should not overlap. Your goal is to proceed all given figures and avoid crossing at any time. Oh. Oh, okay, it's like it's like it's like Tetris, I guess, but the things don't fall down. So whenever you have a row, everything in this row is deleted, and then you have blank space again. So you want to sort of put these tiles in some order so that it works. Interesting. And we can at the end of it, I guess we can have tiles be still like on the grid. They just need to, um, we just need to like not, not run out of space. Do you not even take the, do you not even need to take input? Yeah, we just don't because it doesn't matter really. I think like it'll still, it'll still be fine if you don't read input because it's sort of like, I think it treats it like a file so you can just read it as your, at your own leisure kind of. It's not exactly like that, but it's sort of like that. With interactives, though, it's, like, different. Okay, so essentially we have to have a way to handle an arbitrary sequence of vertical and horizontal prop, or, um, vertical and horizontal tiles, so that no matter what, um, No matter what, everything gets destroyed. Right? So you put these things down, and then when you have a full row or full column, it'll get deleted. Okay, so first of all, neither um, you can't both have a full row. No, you can't. Never mind. I'm done. Ignore that. They can both happen at the same time. Okay, let's see. So we have this grid. What happens when we put something down? Whoa. Why does it do that? Where's my mouse? It's not work anymore. It's kind of sad. Have I told you guys I'm getting a tablet for Christmas? It's going to be great. I'm going to actually... Um, the mouse clicks are going to disappear, I think. I have, wait, I, I can get the um, difficulty distribution. It's on this post. 
I put it in a paste bin so that people um, wouldn't have to put it in a paste bin so that you can just like open it as you want. Yeah. Okay, so say we get some like um, horizontal thing, for example. So we get something here, and then say we get a vertical thing. So if we put it, for example, here, then we're kind of screwing ourselves over because now we sort of like to make either this row or this column disappear. No matter what, we need a we need another vertical thing, right? So consider a scenario where everything we get is still just horizontal then that just like totally screws us over because we're going to have to like put them in different positions. For example, we can put them down here or so, but we just like cut ourselves off from this whole top half of the grid. Why would we do that? We shouldn't do that. So we shouldn't put it here. And so we can put verticals where they're sort of like independent from horizontal sort of here. That way, if we get another horizontal, we can just put something like up here and then that will kill this whole row. And so then we get more space for more horizontals. So in fact, as soon as we get two horizontals, they cancel each other out. Which means that we end up in a position where we can now again put horizontals on this top row. So in a sense, because we keep the verticals independent, we're sort of... We're sort of like handling these horizontals by themselves. So we put one horizontal down here, and then when we get another horizontal, we might as well put it here because that would get rid of the old one. So why don't we just do that? And therefore, for every two horizontals, like they just cancel each other out. So this strategy will now let us have as much space as we want for all of the horizontal ones. So how do we handle the vertical ones? Well, we can just sort of do it in the same way. Like if we put this here and then like we just put them sort of in the same row until they cancel each other out. Then once we get four verticals, and actually we don't have any more space for verticals here, but that's fine because all of these are going to cancel each other out. So now we end up with the same amount of space as the beginning. So we totally ignore the fact that we can get rid of columns too. And all we really do is we, we say that we reserve this first row for we say that we reserve this first row for this for these like horizontal ones and then we say that we reserve the second and third rows for um, like the vertical ones and so these are independent of each other so it doesn't matter what the like order of the sequence is it's kind of just we um, deal with them as we get them. Does that make sense? Oh god, what happened in chat? That's kind of annoying. Um, okay. That is a lot of messages. If they spam again, feel free to ban them, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why you would spam in the first place, but people do what they want, I guess. So anyway, basically this means like um, we have this sort of procedure for putting down things where we would put the first horizontal, for example, how do they dictate it? It would be the um, smallest row and column intersecting with it. Yeah, so basically to represent this, you would print the smallest row and column, which in this case would be the left one and in the vertical case would be the top one, which is actually what I was thinking anyway, so that's kind of nice. Because like, this this is sort of the configuration we're putting horizontal and vertical ones down in. So we put the horizontal ones like this, and then we put the vertical ones like this. For example, here, and here, and here. And then, so the first horizontal we would put here, the second we would put here, 
and then the first vertical we would put here, the second here, the third here, and the fourth here. And so it's kind of like this sort of um, cycle. First we put this in, so all the horizontals, no matter what, have row one. And then what do we do for the column? First it's like one, then it's three, then it's one, then it's three, and so on. And the same thing for the verticals, one, or row two, and then one to two to three to four, etc. So there are many ways you can implement this. You can just like, for example, just like increment, have a pointer representing the current column and then increment that. You can do some tricks with modulo. It doesn't really matter how you do it as long as you can do it. So yeah, I think that, that would just work because it would get rid of, because again, horizontals and verticals are independent. And as soon as we get too many of them, we immediately get rid of them. So. Um, let's see, C into S, so B is equal to currently 1, and actually we'll do 0, and then 0 index, H is equal to 0 as well, for each character, if SI is equal to a 0, then we have a vertical tile, so print row 2, then column v plus 1, because 1 index, then, then we sort of advance it. We advance this pointer we have, and we do mod 4, because when we get to the end, what we want to do is we want to sort of jump back, which is the same as like jumping forward 1, then decreasing by 4. Either way, we would just want to do mod 4, like encapsulates exactly what we want. Otherwise, we have a horizontal tile, so we print 1, and then the same 1 indexing, and then that. And then for the horizontals, we advance by 2, because each time we go up by 2 columns. And then this sort of virtual advance, where we sort of going back after doing mod. So let's see, 2, 1. Two one here. Um, wait, this does not make sense. This should be H, and this should be this should all be H. Yeah. So two one. Um, what color do I use? So two one here, then one one here, then two two here. Let's just um, test this better. Make sure we actually do the cycles. So one, two, three, four, one, one, three, one. Perfect. Oh, I just deleted it all. Cool. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Oh. What have I missed? Yeah, the spamming that's weird. Viewer count has been like slowly fluctuating around sixty nine. It's kind of funny. Yeah, the output formats like, like you print you print only the top, um, the top, the top left position of the thing you put down. So if it's vertical, you would print the upper cell, and if it's horizontal, you'd print the location of the leftmost cell. But it's just like locations, and then obviously the other location can be uniquely determined from what type it is and the um, the position the first the top left one is. By the way, you guys can see my submissions, right? Um, yeah, I'm not in manager mode, so that should work. Isn't starting from the bottom from the vertical ones better? Well, it doesn't really matter. Either way, it's like... Either way, it'll work. Um, graph constructors in the mashup? I'm not sure. I actually don't think I do. Which is a bit unfortunate, but... I'm not sure. I haven't actually... I haven't looked at any of these, so I wouldn't know. So the last row is of no use? Yes, that's correct. I just totally ignore it, because we don't need it. Okay. Now we can go on to D. 
Um, we can do the same, not forgetting to pin the message. Am I able to pin other people's messages? Interesting. I can pin anyone. Okay. Cool. It's like incredibly loud. I'm surprised you guys don't hear this. I guess the noise suppression is really strong or something. Alright. D walking between houses. There are N houses in a row. They are numbered from 1 to N in order from left to right. Initially, you're in the house 1. You have to perform K moves to another house. In one move, you go from your current house to some other house. <coughs> you can't stay where you are in each move. The new house differs from the current house. If you go from the current house to the house Y, the total distance you walked increases by X minus Y units of distance, where A is the absolute value of A. It is possible to visit the same house multiple times, but you can't visit the same house in sequence. Your goal is to walk exactly S units of distance in total. So essentially, um, you have a bunch of houses. Hey, you guys don't have to. You don't have to be here to mod, by the way. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't, like, it's not that significant. If there's some problem in chat, I will eventually deal with it. So it's up to you. How does one become a mod? Um, sort of just be cool. Actually, I'll mod you. You, um, you have a good contribution to this channel. <laughs> Usually, if usually like your comments, that's good. Um, Nepal, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm from the U.S. Um, East Coast, I believe. Okay, right. So we have this sort of um, we have n houses, k moves, and s distance, and we start here. So here's sort of like, you solved the different version of D where you can never go to the same house again. Nice. I guess that's, that's harder, isn't it? Because it's like, is it harder? Do you still have continuity? Or is it like weird? Interesting. Okay, well, it must have been sad to have it like not work on the samples then. <clears throat> Alright, so there's this cool sort of principle that actually applies to a lot of problems like, like this. It's like, um, essentially it's sort of like continuity. So, let's consider the minimum number of moves. Let's consider the minimum number of moves that can, like, or the, sorry, wait, let me, let me describe the problem. So you start in house one, and then you sort of, like, move to another house, and then the, like, and then you're interested in the sum of the distances that you move. So, for example, here you move distance one. If in the next move I then move to this house, then here I would move distance three. And then if I, for example, move back here, 
Now I would move distance two. And then the like the sum of this journey is one plus three plus two, which is six. So we have we have to do exactly k moves and we have to maximize the sum. Um, and is at least two, which is nice. Okay, so first let's think about this is sort of a strategy I mentioned. Let's try to like bound the answer. What's the lowest possible answer we can get? Well, for every house, we have to go to a different one. That's a condition. We can't stay in the same house. So for example, here we can move here. And this would let us move exactly one unit, which is the minimum we can do, because we can't move zero units. But then once we once we like get to this next turn, unlike Neil's version of the problem, we can move back to previous houses that we've been to. So what that means is that again, in the next turn, we can only we can move exactly one like space. And we can't move less than one because moving less than one would mean we stay in the same house. So we have one here and one here, and if we continue every move we can move, ex we're able to move exactly one space because we can just set it up that way. We just move to the adjacent one. And we can't move less than one space, so this is a lower bound. This is, this is the minimum possible answer. One move for each turn, which means that um, since we have k moves and each one costs one, the lower bound is k. So we have the condition that k is less than or equal to s. Right, now let's sort of consider the opposite. What's the maximum possible answer we can get? Well, if we start here, then we want to go far instead of near. So we're starting on one end, let's just like go to the other end, because if we go anywhere less far, then it's going to give us less distance. So we can go to one end, and we can say that this is going to be whatever n minus one is, because that's the amount of distance we move. So n minus 1, which is 6 in this case. No, n minus 1 is equal to 6. But then now we're on the end again. So why don't we just move back to the other end? And notice that n minus 1 is an upper bound on the, on the distance we can move, because like we only have n spots. There's no way we could ever move more than n minus 1 because that would like imply that we're going off the map. So now that we're on the end, we can move another m minus one, which is again the best we could ever do. That's why it's a maximum, like it's the maximum possible answer. And then here we move m minus one again, and we can do this k times as well. So the upper bound on the answer is, this is an S, by the way, an upper bound on the answer is K times M minus 1. Right? Because, like, obviously we just have K moves, each one of them is M minus 1. And, of course, this is just, like, 1 times K, but it doesn't matter. So, any s that's outside this range is immediately impossible. That we can show. But, like now what? Now what can we do with this? Well, consider some strategy. Like you see we're moving here like this, right? And so, for example, each one of these um, each one of these gaps we take can be considered as a move. So each one of these gaps is going to increase the answer by one in this path we made. But this is the maximum possible answer. We may want a lower answer. For example, in this we have n equals seven, um, k equals three which means the answer is between 
3 and 18. But what if we have s equals like 15, for example? Well, we have this path of length 18, but we can sort of like, we can sort of cut it short before we visit all of the, um, before we visit everything. As in, like we have this path. So here, we get here, we visited six. Then we move along, we get here, we visited 12. So instead of going down this whole thing, let's just only, um, let's just only visit, what am I saying? Why is my train of thought so scattered? Let's just only um, visit the first three here. We get rid of this, and then, like, just like, boom, you know? So we visit 15 in total because we sort of exclude these three. Um, right, and if we had even lower, like for example, say we had s equals 12, well we can't get rid of this whole thing because we have to move at least once in each row. But what we can do is we can get rid of these. And then now we have one more to get rid of. So for example, we can get rid of this one. And then now, um, over here, we would move here, and then we would move down, and then our bridge path would sort of, um, like for example, go one over here. And so in that sense, it's sort of like, we actually get rid of, um, no, what am I saying? I sort of drew this wrong. In that sense, we sort of get rid of the ones on the left of the boxes I just drew. like um, here, for example. So this still works. If we move, like basically what we're doing is we're moving n minus one until we can't anymore, and then we move some other distance, and then we move one until we run out of moves. That's the basic idea. So we have something like, like if we consider the distances we travel, it's something like n minus one, n minus one, n minus one, and then we have some like barrier element x. And then we have 1 and 1 and 1 again. So what this does is it basically assures we can get anything. Um, let me try and justify why. Because it's sort of like... Like we start with a sequence of m minus 1s. For example, say we have 3 m minus 1s. And then what we can do is, we can just, at any point, we can just decrease the one we have on the end by one. Uh, let me use the same color so it's not a hassle. So we can just decrease what we have on the end by one. And then again, we can decrease what we have on the end by one. And again, we can do that, and again we can do it, until this becomes one. And then now we can't do anything more. But now we can decrease this one by one. And we can do this until all of the elements are 1. But notice that we start from our upper bound, and we only stop when we hit our lower bound. And in every other case, we can reach every other number by decreasing some of these numbers by 1 enough time so that everything works. So isn't that, like, cool? Like, <laughs> we, have this up, we have this lower bound, and we have this lower bound, and we have a strategy that lets us get anything in between. It's this sort of idea of like continuity, where we have a lower bound, and we have an upper bound here. And we want to see like what, what we can get in the middle. So, wait, how do I, how do you visualize this? And then, sort of because we can decrease by one, like, the, 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 like the range of possible values we can get is continuous. We can get everything in between. There's no, like, there's no sort of gap that we miss out on because every time we can get to the answer by decreasing something by one. So yeah, 
Okay, um, I'm not sure I illustrated the continuity part well, but that's sort of the idea. Like, it's it's the same sort of thing as continuity, where you can get anything in between. So in general, when you have some sort of strategy that you can bound the answers, and you can sort of, like, decrease 1 or decrease by x or something, then it means that, or, like, at every point until you hit a bound, you can, for example, decrease by 1 then it means you have this continuity. That for everything in between the starting point and the ending point, you can get all the values because all the values can be derived from a previous value, but you just add one to it. So if you believe in the, um, what would it be, the intermediate value theorem, then you can trust it. But yeah. So how do we construct such an answer? Well, there's a lot of case work we can do, or we can just like, we can follow this idea of incrementing, of de like decreasing the answer by one. N minus one. Actually, we can increase it by one instead. Maybe that's easier. So say we start with an array of ones. And every element can be at most N minus one. Uh, etc. Right, and then so we just increment this element until either it becomes m minus one, or we get exactly s. Um, but we can't do that exactly because, like. The bounds are big. S is like the maximum feasible possible value of S is like two times ten to the fourth, which it, or two times ten to the fourteenth, which is not something we can simulate. But instead, we can notice that at every point we can increase these numbers by both n minus two. So we increase the number by max of n minus two, and then S. So we can increase that, and then we can decrease S until S becomes zero. So this is sort of the implementation, in, a, in sort of a nice way. You sort of figure out the moves in this array, instead of trying to do a bunch of, like... Instead of trying to do a bunch of annoying casework. Um, and then from here, you can just move left or right that many times. So let's do it. So now we're going to Yeah. So this representation of S, I'm using S to I'm using S in this context to sort of represent the number of moves we have left. Um like we have this many moves left to place down. And so we want to um, we want to make sure that we're able to do that. And then whenever this hits zero, then we don't have to do anything else to the array. And that makes it so we can use this formula because this assumes that like we have s moves left. And so either we put down the maximum moves we can ever put, or we put down the remaining number of moves we have to cover. So yeah, um, first we can check the conditions actually. If um, let's see, k, if, if s is not within this interval, then, wait, then print no, otherwise, print yes, and yeah, I'll demonstrate this with an example too, sure, just to, um, solidify it. So, let's take the... Let's take this sample. Wait. Okay, let me figure out a meaningful sample. So, we, let's say we have n equals 7, k equals 4, s equals 11, or like 13 or something. That should 
work, I think. Yeah, so we start with this array based on ones. And we want the sum of this array to be equal to s. Which means we can we can let some number x, for example, be the current value of s minus the sum of ai. Which means that we have to increment x by a certain amount. So actually, I'm going to do that. Um, instead, I'm going to use this representation for remaining. Actually, I'll call it x. Um, yeah. So n equals 7. Currently, um, x equals 9. And at most, we can increment any, any element by at most 6. So first, we try and increment this as much as we can. So the minimum of x and 6, actually, it would be, wait, let's see. Yeah, we start from 1. So this should be n minus 1, I think. Wait. Yeah, no, 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 no. We can increment this by almost 5, my bad, because the values span from 1 to 6. Right, so here we would go, we would try and increment this as much as possible, which is in this case the minimum of 5 and 9, which is 5. So we add 5 to this, and then this becomes 6. So now, we at the same time, now this increases by 5, which means that we have to decrease x by 5, so let's do that too. Now we have x equals 4. And so now we want to increment this as much as possible by the minimum of these two, because we want to add as many moves as we have to. So here we would increment 4. And then, so this would be 5. And now x equals 0 because we subtract 4 from x. And then here we have nothing more to do, so we would add 0 to the rest of these. And these would stay 1. So you can see it satisfies this form. Um, n minus 1, n minus 1, some value of x, a different value of x than what I'm talking about here, and then a bunch of 1s. Because first, we increment by n minus 1 as much as we can. And then we put the rest, like, in some cell, and then everything afterwards we put down once. So it's going to be that form. And, um, no, these array values are going to be... Oh, yeah, okay. So, I should make that clear. Yeah, that was not clear, sorry. Um... Basically, I'm filling in this array, and each array value represents the length of the ith jump. So, for example, with this array 6, 5, 1, and 1, we would start here. And then in the first move, we say that we're going to jump 6. And then in the second move, we say that we're going to jump 5. And then the third move, we say we're going to jump 1. And then in the fourth move, we say we're going to jump um, 1 as well. So this is very simple to construct because it just means we either add 6 or subtract 5 or whatever we do. All right, that's it. So, um... Min... So this would be m minus 2x. And that's it. So now, now that we have these array values, we just simulate it. So if i is even, then we would want to go right. So cur plus equals a i. Else, we want to go left. So now cur minus equals a i. Um, 
M4, as expected. Ten one, ten one, six five, six five six. Let's see. So that moves nine nine nine. So twenty seven. Wait. Oh, but the first jump is also counted. So thirty six, then five. Yeah, they do the same thing. They just put the they put the biggest jump at the end. I guess this should be exactly what they have. This should be exactly that. Let's make sure we can hit the same bound of K. So 10, 9, and 9. Yeah, and then if we go one too low, then we lose. Seems good. Let's make sure we don't do something dumb like overflowing. First, we check all the con we check the only condition that it's outside of the possible range. And if so, it's impossible. Otherwise, it's always possible when we construct the answer like so. Yeah, I'm trying to, okay, let me reach out. I'm trying to prove a point with Notepad++ that you don't need fancy IDEs to be good. Um, alright. So let me, I think I missed a lot. There was a lot going on, wasn't there? Yeah, so deriving the answer, sure. Uh, what is this stream for? It's about competitive programming, which... There are a bunch of videos on, but this is like a specific subcategory of it, where you have problems where you have to construct answers. It's kind of cool. Let's see. Um, Let's see. Um, clean solution. Yeah. Okay. In in that sense, the fact that I was able to come with a come up with a clean solution, like there's a sort of balance between um, there's a sort of balance between having like a nice codable solution and at the same time doing it quickly, and I think. In some cases, if you, especially if you have something annoying like this, like doing the case workout was the first thing I came up with, and that's and that's not nice. So in some cases, I definitely think it's worth it to even if you have a working solution, take a bit more time, like a few minutes, and just try and make it nicer. Because if you do that, then it could save you more time, and that you might not have wrong answers because the code's cleaner, and at the same time, it might just be easier because you have fewer details to work out. Um, yeah, sort of, um, I would recommend doing that at some points, especially with terrible implementation. Um, is this for a job? No. Well, yes and no. In certain countries, yes, competitive programming is, like, important for jobs and, like, interviews and things. But at this level, it's sort of, like, less important. There's a certain level you should get to to be sort of proficient in interview problems, and it's sort of a different game, actually, but this is sort of more of, like, a theoretical sense than anything else. It's a lot. Mostly it's for fun. Mostly it's for fun. Uh, it's sort of, like, intellectual stimulation. Teaching as a job in the future. That's kind of an interesting prospect. I'm not sure. I don't know. Doing this is sort of fulfilling, but at the same time, like, I don't know how sustainable that will be. We'll see how competitive programming grows in the future, I guess. Do I watch K-pop? Not really. I know a lot of my, um, a lot of my fans end up doing it, but. I'm not, like, that into it. I don't hate it. I just don't, like, I don't know enough about it to love it. Yeah, so, let's see. You got, let's see, any questions about this setup before I get rid of it? 
How do you think that the sum of all jumps will be s? Well, I mean, like, that's the condition of the problem, isn't it? It just sort of forces it to be like that. Okay, I guess um, D is good, and if not, I can just undo it anyway. Do I have a C++ physical machine? I wish I did, honestly. I think that would speed up my computer a bit, but unfortunately, I'm stuck with this laptop that breaks every... like, pieces are coming off of it. It's a very interesting physical setup. Yeah, the closest thing I have to a physical machine is my laptop. It's not that good. Unfortunately, Java's kind of Java. Ha, Java kind of has me beat there. Okay, let me um, do the standard stuff. Do I use pen and paper to solve problems? No, not usually. In fact, like. Because I do screencasts so much, I've just gotten used to doing scratch work on paint and stuff. So it, it just ends up working fine. And then when I get a writing tablet, it's going to be fast enough to simulate writing anyway. So it, I don't think it's a problem to do it on the computer. By the way, it's still working on Code Forest, right? Yeah, it is, okay. We have a mist of fluorescence. There's some backstory in the top. There are four kinds of flowers in the world. Let's denote them as A, B, C, and D. The wood can be represented by the wood. No. The woods, I guess, can be represented by a rectangular grid of N rows and M columns. In each cell of the grid, there is exactly one type of flower. According to Mina, the numbers of connected components formed by each type of kind of flowers are A, B, C, and D. Two cells are considered in the same connected component if and only if a path exists between them that moves between shells, cells sharing common edges and passes only through cells containing the same flowers. In order to help Kano depict such a grid of flowers with N and M arbitrarily chosen under the constraints given below, it can be shown that at least one solution exists under the constraints of this problem. Interesting. Note that you can choose arbitrary N and M under the constraints below. They are not given in the input. N and M are up to 50. Okay. So we have a certain number of connected components, and I guess we would print A, B, C, and D. Oh, that's so annoying. Oh, that's so annoying, isn't it? Okay, so all of them are at least one, which is cool. Let's see. So what's the hardest case? Is it something like one, one, one and one hundred? How do we handle that one? No, we can't do them in a single row, because then the number of components can be up to 100, but we can only have up to 50 things. Oh, wait, I see how this would work. Okay. So...
I guess when we have one, 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 a hundred, let's say red, let's say we have red, um, blue, green, and orange for the colors. So then, for example, we can do something like this. We can have the red sort of span this like whole, um, this is terrible to implement, so let's not do that, but we can have the red sort of span this whole grid. But this would only work if Yeah, okay. So with this case, we can have these reds span this whole grid. And that means that we have a ton of individual components, and what the hell, why is that so loud? And all of these could be orange, right? And all of these oranges will be different components. So we can do this as many times as we want. And then in that sense, once we run out of other components to put down, I guess we can make the rest of these red as well. And then that way, it won't add any extra components, and all of them will be red anyway. Okay. Now this would work, but only if red is one, which is kind of a problem, right? We we might not have that. Colin Galen equals allogenic. Is that right? It's like missing a character, isn't it? And if you put if you spell allogenic with two n's, then it would work. <laughs> Right, okay. But this is sort of the idea, isn't it? Where we can have this sort of grid of reds where the reds separate everything. Um, okay, but again, the problem is that like, if we ever have more than one red, this wouldn't work. And all of these numbers could be more than one, so it may be possible that we don't have anything. Let's see, is this, okay, I'm sure these samples are like specifically designed to mislead us. Although actually it sort of gives that idea out, doesn't it? That's sort of what they're doing. That's interesting. You just paste the definition of allogenic. Oh my god, it's Anton, what's up? I'm sorry that I didn't have any of your problems. I uh, couldn't look at them, so I wouldn't have known, unfortunately. And for some reason, the comment was, like, deleted by YouTube or something, so I'm not sure why that happened, but it's not public anymore. Or maybe it was, like, self-deleted. That works, too. Okay, right? So we have this sort of construction, and it will work for, um, there's a reason I'm extending these lines down. In fact, there's a reason I'm doing this, too. I'm trying to draw a straight line. It's not working. Oh, my God. <clears throat> okay, but, like, this is cool, but it's, like, not cool because it doesn't work. But it, like, almost works. It does, it does three of the colors. Like, this will handle everything but reds itself. So, what if we did better? What if we, what if the whole grid wasn't this red thing? And so somewhere like, for example, say this is like half of the grid. And then in this other half of the grid, somehow we have to make the number of red components that we need. So essentially, we have two separate problems now. Here, we're going to solve the problem for everything except red, because here we can do that with this construction. And then here, somehow we have to solve the red problem. But why, why are we only 
why are we constraining ourselves to have this grid only be red? What I'm saying is, why don't we just do the same thing that we did for red down in here? Or we put some sort of like, for example, a blue lattice down. And then in between these, in these holes in the lattice, we can put the reds that we want down. You know what I'm saying? We just like do the same strategy, but with a different color. And that means that in this half, in this top half, we can solve the blue, the green, and the orange at the same time by separating them with the red lattice. And then in this one, we can solve the red by separating it in the blue lattice. Um, the problem I select here is, is for beginners, some of them. They're so, they sort of scale quickly in difficulty, but the easier, like the earlier ones should be relatively easy. Yeah, these problems are from code forces. I just like picked random ones, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, this one's actually kind of cool. Like it's this, it's this weird sort of lattice, right? So the way to sort of inspire the solution was again to try and find like one of the worst possible cases. So for example, this one would be bad because we have everything's one except for something that's huge. Which means that somehow like we have to do something for these orange components that's like like we have to separate these orange components from everything else. while only having one component of each color. And so that gives us the idea that we give, like we give each of the orange components um, sort of their own space, and we separate them by this huge red component. And there are a million ways to do this. One of the simplest ways to implement this would be a lattice, where every, for example, like everything that isn't, everything that, for example, doesn't have both coordinates even. So like I even, like for example, both R and C are even, will be red. I guess you can also do it like a, no, you can't do it like that. Yeah, you would want the whole thing to be connected. So it can't be something like a chessboard. It would have to be some sort of lattice like this. And then you have a bunch of holes where each hole is something where R and C is even, and then you can do anything in these holes. So that's cool. So let's consider what would happen in like an eight by eight grid, for example. Um, actually a six by six grid would be better, I think. Or easier to draw is what I'm thinking. So first we would put the red lattice down. So everything that isn't that doesn't have both coordinates even will not be will be part of the lattice. So that would be everything except these three cells, which means I'll mark everything else in red. Tediously and annoyingly without flood fill. Actually, I'm just draw I'm just drawing a bunch of W's and I don't know why. <laughs> no, not that one. Right, now you see with this construction that we have these three sort of holes. And in these holes, we can do whatever we want. So for example, we can make this one orange, we can make this one green, and maybe we have only one blue. So we would make this red again. And this means that even if we have extra holes, it doesn't matter because we can fill them in with red and not affect the answer. And then in the same regard, we do the same thing for like, for example, blue down here. It may actually be easier to define these as point, like the, the non-lattice points are the ones where both coordinates are odd, but it doesn't really matter. Actually, I may, I may do that. I think I'll do that. That is slightly more convenient. Actually, it doesn't matter that much, but less thinking is better. 
So non-lattice points are the ones where both coordinates are odd. And then again, we have these three holes. If we want extra reds, we can put them down here. And then we can put any other color. Now this is only 6 by 6. If we do this for a 50 by 50 grid, then we're going to get like... It's on the order of like 50 by 50 over 4, which is like 600. Which is much more than we need to have all these be 100. So we can fill in these spaces as we want. Oh, actually, wait, maybe it's not much more than we need. Maybe it's like exactly what we need. Oh, wait, no, never mind. It's fine, it's fine. The point is it's going to be fine. Even like constrained to one half, we still have over 300 in, we ever still have like over 300 non-lattice points, which means that Everything's going to be nice and happy. Okay. So we can assume we're using a 50 by 50 grid every time because why not? Now, um, now I'm using this count array to basically represent how much we have left. So automatically we're putting this red and this blue lattice down. So we can increment, we can decrement the first and the second because that's going to be one of the components. Then, so this is the red lattice. The rows will go up to 25 because it's the first half of the grid. And the columns will just be the whole grid. So if i and j are even, actually, zero indexed, both like this would mean that both of them are odd, because this would be like position 1, 1. So if both of these are odd, um, then we need to figure out the cells we need to put down. Alright, so first of all, this is if we're in the lattice, or like, not part of the lattice. Otherwise, we are part of the lattice, which means that this is just, this has to be red. Um, Matt, I, J, equal to R. Why don't they just like have these be zeros, ones, two, and threes? Come on, this is like annoying. Alright, so somehow we have to do this in an order that's not going to screw us over later. Which means that, like, in the first place, it can't hurt to try the blue ones first, because if we do that, then even if we don't have enough spaces here, we'll have put down all the blue ones, which means we can satisfy the remaining orange and green ones down here in the second half. So we can consider the, we can consider the blue ones first. So first, wait, is this a... No. So if, if we like put this order in a string sort of, first we consider the blue ones. Then we can consider the um, the green ones and the orange ones in any order. And then at the end, we consider only the red ones because we put the red one down if we don't want any more components of the other ones. So red would be last. Then um, So if count C minus A, this will just convert it to one of these numbers. 
is greater than zero, which means we have something to put down. Then we set it to that. And at the same time, now we've used that position so we can break. Actually, we don't even need this. Um, we can just sort of assume that everything's red unless we set it to not be red. And then we don't even need this else. Yeah, so we can assume these things are red and then later we fill them in with other colors if we want. Now we do the same thing, but on the bottom. And this time we want to consider the red ones first. So first we consider A, then we can do any order we want. This is the second half, so we start from 25. There's almost the same code, I'm just typing it out again because I don't want to make copy-paste errors. So now we assume they're blue. And now, this would be only the case if both coordinates 0 indexed are even, which means, like for example, this one's 4, 0, this one's 4, 2, etc. So if i is even and j is even, then this is actually the exact same code, so I'll just copy paste that in. Then, just like print the grid. Cool. This is going to be hard to read. So let's see. So here we put the blue down. We put the blue down again, which means we use two of these. Now we put the green, we put the, the C and the C and then the D. So we use these and we use these. And then in this blue, we put down four A's, which is what we want. And then, for example, here, we would do the same thing. Put down a lot of B's and a lot of A's. And we have like way more space than we would ever need, I think. Actually, yeah, wait, what was I thinking? How did I think we would run out of space here? We have like 1250 over 4. Each row is 25. Wait, what if I. Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah, okay, never mind. It is actually kind of close. Let's think of the worst case 100, 100, 100, 100. Looks like we have enough. Yeah, looks good. Put down a ton of blues. Um, separate worst case. Um, nothing in red, nothing in blue. Perfect. Nice. What have I done there? Have I messed this up somehow? What have I done? Token parameter. Oh, wait. Oh, whoops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I did not mean to put R. I meant to put um, A. That was dumb. Cool. Seems legit. Yeah, the cough is kind of bad. I try to, like, not be too loud about it, but it's, like, hard when I'm talking a lot and writing code and stuff. I will try though. Um, what else? 
Anton is here. Anton Ors, as always. Red is nothing, but pink is pretty good, and also like being a legendary coordinator and stuff like that. I think that's pretty good. I would say personally. Uh, why do I use my setup? Just because I'm comfortable with it. Like it just works, and it's not annoying, and it's not a hassle. And I can always trust that when I have some weird bug, it's not my IDE screwing me over, it's just myself screwing me over. So I like having that security because sometimes like IDEs just give you weird things but they don't change your file or something. So I'd prefer just to not have that happen. Do I only use mouse? Yes, I only use my mouse. You've written a rap. Can you share it here? As long as it's not spammy, just like, please don't spam. This is annoying. But why not? <laughs> I may regret saying this. What have I done? Am I going to regret saying this? Yeah, I think my handwriting might actually become worse. That's like a plausible possibility when I get a writing tablet. Not sure. Um, okay, nice. <laughs> Alright, we continue. Current mashup is this. Don't think it's possible to get any worse. All right, all right, I see, I see, I see. Fine. <clears throat> and uh, it's a combination of trying to write write fast and also um, be somewhat legible. I'm not sure about that. Because you know, you always understand what you write yourself, and then it's hard to like perceive how other people are gonna be able to interpret it. Right, okay, so we have a Marco and GCD sequence. In a dream, Marco met an elderly man with a pair of black glasses. The man told him the key to immortality and then disappeared with the wind of time. When he woke up, he only remembered that the key was a sequence of pot. No, the rap is fine, I guess. <laughs> when he woke up, I guess. When he woke up, he only remembered that the key was a sequence of positive integers and something like then, but forgot the exact sequence. What the elements of the sequence be? A1, A2, AN. He remembered that he calculated GCD of AI, AI plus 1, AJ for every I is less than J is less than N, and put it into a set S. A set. Okay. Note that even if a number is put into the set S twice or more, it only appears once in the set. Now Marco gives you the set S and asks you to help him figure out the initial sequence. If there are many solutions, print any of them. It is also possible that there are no sequences that produce... Oh, come on. There are no sequences that produce the set S... In any case, print negative one. Why is, why is well, Of course, of course they make it not possible. Why would they not? Um, did I, what about the non one GCDs? Oh, okay. I guess it's fine if it's not existent. Um, what's happening?
So we want a solution with n at most 4,000, which is 4 times this. What's the significance of 4? So here it's impossible because the GCD of these two elements is 1, but that's not a thing. So first if we consider the maximum of the set. This maximum... This maximum has to be like its own element, because if it's not, then how would you ever get it as a divisor? So this maximum has to be part of the set. And then So then how would this work? So for example, we can consider 2, 4, 6, 12. Well, this one's, this one's kind of a lame sample because it's kind of like predetermined. But so first we put down 12. And then this 12 gives us a GCD of 12, so we can kind of ignore this. Now we can look at the next biggest element. Either it's a direct consequence of Either it's a direct consequence of some elements we already have in the sequence, or it's not. And if it's not, then... Like, it has to be, um... It has to sort of be on its own, I guess. Hmm. So, for example, here we'd be forced to put down 6 because there's no other way we would get 6. And also note that all the elements must be in the sequence because, or all the elements must be in the set, because if they aren't, then there's no way this would happen. All right, why is there no way this would happen? Because, like, say we have some other element. Um, let's see. If we had two elements such that their GCD was four, then... How, how do I explain this? I had more elements that their GCD was 4, then either they would all be 4s, or they would be some multiple of 4. But like, if there's a multiple of 4, why even do that? Because having a multiple of 4 would mean that you run the risk of having some GCD that is in the set. For example, we can't have 8 here because 8 is in the set. So why don't we just, like, put 4 down? Um, for example, like this. And then... Here we can either explicitly have 2 or we might not. It doesn't matter because 2 is a direct consequence of the GCD of 6 and 4. 
So what seems kind of like, like if I is equal to J, then the GCD is just the element itself. Should I read chat? I'm trying to balance reading chat because I get I get a bunch of complaints that I spend too much time reading chat and then it like cuts the explanations in half, which is fair. But at the same time, like reading chat is kind of the whole point of the stream, isn't it? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what this right balance is. Let me just respond to everything, I guess. Is Sophie a stalker? Definitely. Um, what was my math experience? Yeah, as as Everrule said, I am math phobic, so I like didn't really like it and didn't do it that much, and then eventually now I'm doing this, which sort of forces me to do math, so it's kind of sad. Do I plan on setting problems? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not like that creative. It would be hard for me to do that, but I could try potentially in the future. Um, whenever you come across at most a certain number of operations, is it an instinctive to do it in exactly those many operations? Well, that's one thing you could try. Like, um, basing a strategy off of the upper bound could be possible. And it's generally a smart thing to think of because that's the sort of information you have. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it always has to be that upper bound. It can just be any working strategy. Like, for example, if you have like three n queries or something, maybe you have something that takes O of n queries to do, and then, like, with that something, I don't know, um, with that something, you can, like, do some other things. I think in general, with some sort of, like, constructors where you can, like, modify elements and stuff, you want to find the extent of the operations you can do. Like, if you can... If you can, for example, like write down the XOR of any two numbers, then you can like sort of get any XOR you want in a certain number of operations, right? Things like that. So that if you, these are not good examples. Let's say, like there are some interactives, for example, where you have to figure out the whole array or something. And if it's something like XOR, if you can find the value of some element, then you can find the whole array in like O of n queries or something. So then it comes down to finding the value of some element. And in a sense, you can do that by messing with the upper bound and seeing how many queries you have left to do that. And sometimes it doesn't work, in which case you can just try other things, I guess. Ever rule versus Colin constructive lockout duel. I 2,700? I'm already like not in the optimal state to like do anything. Don't think that is a good thing to have. Oh wait, what did I just I did not mean to did I do anything? Interestingly, you need only O of log A elements. Is that something like, uh, is that like linear algebra stuff? I can go over IOI coins, maybe. I don't know, I solved that yesterday, which means that it wouldn't be the same feel as the stream. I don't know, possibly. Okay, anyway, that was sort of a hiatus. So let's get back to this. So if we put all the elements How how would this work? If we put all of the if we put all of the elements in somehow.
Yeah, I know. But as um, as was said, it, it's probably also been covered in other places. Although I haven't watched those videos, so I'm not sure how good they are. Right, okay. So, like... What, what would happen if we put all of these... Because if i is equal to j, then the GCD is just the element itself, what would happen if we just made the sequence all of this, this whole thing? How would that screw us over? Like, maybe consider the GCD of the whole sequence, then, um... What would happen then? Oh, wait. That would work, wouldn't it? Just had a... Eureka moment. Well, okay, so the problem with um, the problem with okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to explain this, but the problem with like having the whole sequence be part of the sequence is that like let me find a counterexample. Is there even a counterexample? I think there would be. Like say the sequence is um, Ten, six, and two, for example. How would this work? Like ten, eight, and two, maybe. Um. Or something like that. 10, 8, and 2. I'm trying to find a counterexample to the solution that I'm like thinking about. Because if I can do that, then that shows the necessity of this weird thing I just came up with. Like, the, the initial idea is that every element in the sequence must be a GCD anyway. So why not just have this, why not just print the sequence? Does that even work? I, I don't think it would work. But is there a reason it doesn't work? Because, like, the issue is with some consecutive elements, um, you can't, like, you may not, like, you may get some weird GCD that isn't in the set. I, I think. Oh, yeah, that's simple. Say you have the case, like, 12, 8, and 2. 12, 8, and 2, or 2. Then if you just put the set down, the problem with this is that the GCD of these two is 4, and that doesn't work. So you can't just put the sequence down. <clears throat> because it may happen that between two adjacent numbers or some range, you may get something that isn't the minimum GCD. The rating of the problem, 1900 right now. You may get something that isn't in the GCD. But what if we made it so, like, we forced everything to have the... <coughs> okay, that was not into the mic. I hope that wasn't loud, though. What if we, like, force it so we can't get any weird sub... We can't get any weird GCD with, um... We can't get any weird GCD with certain values, or like with certain subarrays. So what we mean is that we would sort of want to separate this 12 and 8. So what if we did it like so? If we put the minimum value in between, then the minimum value is going to sort of like eat the GCD of everything else. So for example, we have 12, and then 2, and then 8. 
And this would work because this two sort of separates it. But why don't we just like keep doing that? Where we can say we had, for example, like 12, like we had a lot of things, like 16 or like a bunch of multiples of four where we can't have any of them together, like 20, 16, 12, and eight, and then we had a two here. Why don't we just keep doing that? We can have a 20, and then if we have it next to any of these elements, we're screwed. But we can put down this 2 in between, and that would make it so the GCD is the minimum of the values. And then if we put down a 16 here, then we can put another 2 to separate it from all the other values. And then we can put this 12 down and also separate it, and then we can put this 8 down and also separate it. And so the cool part about this is that, like, it... Because this is our, this has to be an element of the sequence anyway, because there's no other way to have the GCD be this, you can use this to separate the values. So yeah, spamming twos in between, that's exactly like, that's, that's exactly what it is. You just spam twos everywhere, and it just makes everything work. OK, here, here's why this is correct, because like, Maybe you don't want twos, right? Because maybe things aren't multiples of twos, and then you have a problem. Like if we have some odd number, what are we going to do about that? All right? So let's make some claims. I'm going to prove this solution now. Let's make some claims. First, consider the. Let x be the minimum GCD. So for example, in this in this sample case we have, in this in this case we're working with, x equals 2. Now, if x is not in the array, then there's actually wait, that's like wrong. But um Okay, yeah, wait, no, no. What I'm saying is wrong. But there's there's an there's an easy way to kind of prove this. GC the GCD of A and B is less than or equal to their minimum. Because um that's just the way it works. Like, because both A and B are like numbers that are included in this GCD. This number would have to be a divisor of both A and B, which means if it's greater than their minimum, then there's no way it can ever be a divisor of A or B. There's no way it can ever be a divisor of the minimum because it's bigger than it. How would that even work? So the first step is that when we stick in more numbers, like say we consider this running GCD, and when we stick in more numbers, the GCD is only going to decrease, which means that whatever this minimum GCD is, for example, this 2, the GCD of the whole array has to be equal to that. Um, right, so now if you sort of believe in the number theory, basically, like, the GCD of the whole array is going to be equal to the GCD of all of these subarray GCDs. Because notice that everything like every element of the sequence has to be one of these numbers because if it's not then there's some divisor that it like doesn't have because again if i equals j the gcd is just the number itself so all these numbers must be in the sequence otherwise they wouldn't be in this set or every number in the sequence must be part of the set is what i'm saying which means that like Every number in the set is some divisor that comes up in some subarray of the sequence. So why I'm saying believe in the number theory is basically because the GCD of the whole sequence is going to be the same as the GCD of every element in the set. That's like a big claim. Because when that's true... That's like it. We just need to verify that the minimum GCD is going to be equal to the GCD of everything in the set. If it's not, for example, if we have this case where we have a 7 here, like for example 20, 12, 7, and 2, then the GCD of this whole array is 1. 
And like that just kind of like it makes it makes sense in some way because if we have this seven here, then there's some elements such that seven is like a divisor of it. <clears throat> Which means that the GCD of whatever that element is. Or I mean there's some subarray. Okay. So in this sort of structure, there's some subarray such that the GCD is seven. Which means that there's also some subarray, which means that in this subarray, two is not a divisor of it, because if it was, then the GCD would be 14. So we have some sort of way to get two like kind of out here. And that means that the GCD of the whole sequence is going to take the GCD of these two elements, and it will be one, which will be not two, and so it's not present. Um, and this sort of like generalizes, I would say. So what I'm saying, what, what, what my claim basically is, is that if this minimum element is not the GCD of every element in the sequence, or in the set, then it's impossible. And this is important because this strategy we have wouldn't work if the GCD of the whole thing is not equal to the minimum. Because then we would have some element that's like not divisible by the minimum right next to a minimum, and we'd have some other things. So it doesn't work, but it's fine, because if this doesn't work, then it's impossible. So in every case where it's possible, this strategy will work, and if it doesn't work, it's impossible. That means that this strategy will always work, or it will always be correct. And so the strategy is, again, to basically like spam twos or spam the minimum GCD. We like put every number in the sequence in the set down, because we need them as GCDs anyway, why not? And then we just stick some more twos in between so that the GCD of every element with any other element will be equal to the minimum. And the minimum's already in the set, which means that it's fine if we do this. And it'll mean that we don't get any other weird, like sort of if we have something like 20 and 16, we'll get 4, which is not in the set. But if we have this 2 in between, it'll be forced to be 2. Right, that's the idea. So the code's really simple, just like, um, first just check the condition. If the GCD of everything is equal to the GCD of the minimum, then we're good. Does this work? Does GCD work with zeros? I feel like it, I remember it not working, but I don't know. Hopefully this is fine. G equals GCD of G and AI, which of course we have to read in as input first. Then if G is not equal to A0, um, then it's not possible. Otherwise, we can just stick some twos in between, or stick the minimum element. So we just print the value and then put another of the minimum element in as a buffer. Close this, minimize. Yep, so 2, 4, 6, 12, and 2's in between. And here it's not possible. And this is like O of n. Is it O of n? It's like O of n, O of n plus log something? Wait, what? Oh, what have I done now? Have I misread this somehow? Oh, I have to print the length. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. How would they know what to do if they didn't have the length? Cool. My jaw is doing great right now. I do run my code locally, that's what this is. Although this was just like, putting this in was just a tiny fix, so it's like I figured it would work without having to retest it.
Yeah, it was it was the one line change. Well, the thing is, in general, GCD is logarithmic, but there's some special, like... Wait, is it not visible? Oh, come on. It's like... It's, it's dumb. I thought I was on this unofficial leaderboard where things just, like, work. Is it not visible for people? Come on, code forces. Well, yeah, the thing is, GCD is logarithmic, but taking the GCD of a bunch of elements is not necessarily logarithmic. I think there's some proof that it's like, it's like n plus the log of the maximum instead of n times. Because, like, again, the GCD is monotonic as you go down. And if it's a divisor, then the GCD will, um, I think the simple argument is that if it's a divisor, then the GCD will finish in one move because it'll be, or it'll finish in like one or two moves because like A mod B will be zero. And so you'll have zero and just be done. And if it's not a divisor, then the GCD will go down. And I think it like, it has to go down by at least two each time, or like it has to go down by a factor of at least two each time. So it would still be like, like in total, n moves are done plus the number of times it goes down, which is at most log or something. Something like that. I'm not sure of the exact thing. Okay, let's. Yeah, it also has implications about segment tree, which is kind of cool. Uh, right, now we'll do G. And then pin it. Okay, supposedly this is harder. So, um, that's fun. Long challenges? I don't know. I tend to not cover those because I'm, like, not good at them and I solve nothing. And it's, like... I don't want them to be rated because it's too much effort and it's just going to destroy me. So I don't know. I think generally Code Chef has that covered, doesn't it? Oh my god, n is 22. You're going to write a with n distinct integers. Construct an array b by permuting a such that for every non-empty subset of indices, the sum of elements on that positions is a and b. And A and B are different. All right, so first it has to be a derangement, sure. And then what? It's be like a, a Derangement meaning like no element can be in its original position. Do the values themselves matter? I think it, it must, right? Do the values themselves matter? And did I pin the message? Yeah, I did. Cool. Do the values themselves matter? That's the first question. We have a... Uh, well, it definitely could matter, I think. Like, for example, if everything's a power of 2, then we could do anything we want. But if we have something like 1, 2, n, then maybe not.
Uh, for example, here, it doesn't matter what we do as long as we just don't have the same elements in the same positions. Randomize? Oh, there's got to be... Is, it should be something better than randomize. I'd be sad if it was. What's the probability of a, of a permutation being fine? Hope intended is not randomized because n is so small. Like that's got to mean something. Screams like bitmask or something. What's two to the twenty second? Is that is that small enough? It's like four million, right? Four million with two seconds. I don't know. So and it's important that A is distinct. Otherwise, I think there's always a way to mess with things. How do we just make it... For starters, how do we just make it so, like... The um, just the indices. There's no like subset with the same indices. Like for example, if we have one, two, three, and four, maybe, then something that would work would be like would a cyclic shift work? Wait up. Would it work for this purpose? Well, the cycle would be the length of the whole array. So there's, this wouldn't work in the general case probably, but it would work for something like, for example, when all we care about is that the indices we have aren't the same. So it wouldn't always work, but it works sometimes, and that's a start. Let's see. How how well does this cyclic shift idea work? Let's say we have like some ugly elements. Like it works for this one because the difference between this is like let um let like x equals max. x equals max, or x equals, m yeah, max, and y equals min. So this is like, this is interesting. This is, this value is a2 minus a1. This value is a3 minus a2. This value is a4 minus a3. And then this value is a1 minus a4. Imagine the values were sorted, right? That's kind of nice because that would be good, wouldn't it? Because like this would just work. 
All of these values are greater than zero, except for this one, which is less than zero. And actually, all these differences are also greater than zero, which means that no matter what subset we pick, this is always going to be strictly greater than this if we only have these elements, because all these elements, all these elements are bigger than all of these ones, like their um, their corresponding ones. And here is the only issue. First of all, this element is less than zero, which is fine. So this element itself would be fine. But the question is, can we pick some subset of these and then combine it with this one? And I think we just can't. Because, like, the sum of these, the sum of ai plus 1 minus ai is, like, i equals 1 to m minus 1 is equal to a n minus a 1. And the reason this is like, the reason this works is because like, if you think about it like this, a four minus a three plus, actually I'll get rid of the parentheses, a four minus a three plus a three minus a two plus a two minus a one, then these, this is like, it's called telescoping. Basically, everything cancels out except for the last elements because this is positive and negative here. And actually, I'll move these pluses over here to make it even more clear. That you have a positive and negative A3, you have a positive and negative A2, and so on. So this is A4 plus 0 plus 0 minus A1. And because all these values are zero, that means there's no subset of these differences that you can get to. There's no subset of these differences that you can get to make this possible, except for the full array. But obviously, that would be zero anyway. So that sounds fine. All right. So the problem is it only works if the permutation is sorted. Um. Which is fine, we can handle that. But like, okay, so how do we even get here, right? Like what 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 motivated this cyclic shift? First, we were trying to solve a simpler problem. The simpler problem was that instead of making the sums be the same, we just wanted to make it so there of every subset, there's no element that's or like like the indices aren't the same in this subset. So for example, here, like the set of indices here is one, three, and four. And the set of indices here is 2, 3, and 4, and these are different. But if we had some other construction, like, for example, 1, 2, 3, and then, like, um, 2, 1, or, like, 2, 1, 3, for example. Um, wait, 2, 1, 3, right? Yeah. Then, like, if we group these together, these would be the same, and this would be the same. So considering like the way to represent permutations, which is like a bunch of cycles, like for example, you can follow this to element two and then follow this to element three and then this to four and then eventually back to one. And this sort of forms a cycle. If we consider the cycle decomposition of this permutation, it must have exactly one cycle. Like the whole thing must be a cycle. Otherwise, we can sort of break it into these subsets. A single cycle will be a subset that doesn't work. So the whole permutation must be a big one big cycle. And one way to accomplish a cycle is a cyclic shift. And then that was all the thought I had. And then after that, it was just trying random things, as always. And this one just happened to work. That's like, that was all the, 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 the hidden thought process that all went, that all happened in like a split second or something. All right. So consider a simplification, try and solve that, and then just like extend it. And it just happens to work, actually. But again, this only works if the array is sorted. So what we can do is we can instead work with pairs of ai and then i, and then sort that.
and then, like we can sort this and then um and then we can consider these the values and then we can do this strategy with these values and then eventually like use these indices to restore the permutation and i think the same argument will work because like like we're, we're working with subsets here it doesn't matter that i just happen to write these out in a line in increasing order they can be in any order they want but as long as we make it so we have this property of like telescoping and differences and whatnot which means that the initial thing has to be sorted, then this should work. So let's see. Um, read into n, read in the values. Why can't you just sort the array if it isn't sorted? Because then it wouldn't, like the point is that it has to match with A. We can't sort A because A is fixed. It has to like work and it has to sort of like complement this A. So we have to restore the original indices. Otherwise, like everything's going to be out of order and this just wouldn't be true. Um. I'm gonna mod Neo because it's actually OP. Okay, so um, pair. We can work with these pairs. Then we can read in the first value and then that second is equal to i. And then we can sort these. But yeah, we have to maintain the original indices, otherwise, everything's just gonna be totally out of order. Then, um, We cyclically shift it by one, which means p two i is equal to um, p i plus one mod n. What did I print here? Why did I do that? Um, p i plus one mod n because since we want this to map to the one ahead, but if it like if it like goes off the array, then it has to sort of loop back around. That's what the mod does. Okay, and actually, I don't even need this at all. Um, sort of for conceptual purposes, I'll leave this in, even though it's redundant. So now we have this permutation, we have to restore it to the original array. So we say that. Um, now we have this output array b. So b of the original index, so p2i dot second, is equal to its value. Again, it's redundant. You can do better, but it doesn't matter. Let's see. This should work. Does not work. Nice. Uh, what's wrong with that? What have I done? It's like the exact opposite of what we want. What? What exactly is happening? I'm getting some weird psych fault or something. Why is it not even okay? So two one one zero. I want to cyclic shift the values, but not the indices. Okay. Um, pi plus one dot end up first pi dot second. Yeah, okay. So from here, if we have these pairs of like, like for example, this is 7 in index, this is 7 in index 3, this is 2 in index 4, or 2 in index 1, this is 3 in index 
Actually, it would be sorted. So it'd be like 2 in index 3, 7 in index 1, 5 in index 2, 15, and then 20 in index 0. Then we would want to not cyclic shift both because that would be pointless. We only want to cyclic shift the values. And that would mean that we maintain the original indices, but like offset all the values by one mod n. That is a mistake. So this should just be like a normal cyclic shift. Yeah, 1, 1,110. And it will work. Supposedly. Cool. <clears throat> okay, what's in chat? Um, is it possible to find count of numbers divisible by x? Yeah, that one's that one's hard. I was not able to come up with anything with that either, except for like maybe square root or something. If you had like a um, I guess you can do it in something like O of um like yeah, like n times the maximum number of divisors times log n or something for that. Yeah, wait, what was the purpose of n equals twenty two? I want to read the editorial for this. Why did they have that? Um, wait, let me check this for a second. What was the point of this? So this is div 1b, I assume. Sort the array and shift it by... They just don't talk about n equals... Why, did they, why would they do that? Are they just, like, trying to mess with us? To, like, think about some bitmask solution or something? Because that was the first hunch that I had from such a small value of n. But I guess not. All right, so yeah, always possible. S cyclically shift the sorted values, and then it would work. And is two hundred thousand is kind of giveaway. Yeah, that's true. I guess. Sort of like not um, having the constraints be as large as possible because it doesn't really matter. Is it even possible to do some sort of bit mass solution? Or would it just not work? Like to try and cheese the problem with that? <clears throat> this problem was 2000. In general, you can find the uh, difficulties in this link in the description. Okay, this one's called down or right. This is the last one. After that, maybe I can take a couple of requests as long as they aren't too hard because I want to finish this stream eventually. This was, this was shorter than I expected, to be honest. Although I guess there's less conceptual stuff to explain, so it kind of makes sense. This is the last problem. As always, I'm linking the mashup, etc., etc. All right, let's do this. This is an interactive problem. Cool. I might do interactives as a separate stream as well, because those are fun. I like doing those, so why not? And they come up often enough to be like useful, I would say. All right, this is an interactive problem. Bob lives in a square grid of size n times n, n, times n with rows numbered 1 through n from top to bottom, and columns numbered 1 through n from left to right. Every cell is either allowed or blocked, but you don't know the exact description of the grid. You are given only an integer n. You are given at most four n queries of form question mark r1, c1, r2, c2. The answer will be yes if Bob can get from a cell r1, c1 to a cell r2, c2, and no otherwise. In particular, if one of the two cells are both as a block cell, then the answer is no for sure. Since Bob doesn't like short trips, you can only ask queries with the Manhattan distance between the two cells at least n minus 1, i.e. the following condition must be satisfied. R, R2, my, yeah, yeah, like the, like it has to be far enough away. R2 minus R1 plus C2 minus C1 is greater than or equal to n minus 1. It's guaranteed that there is such a path, and your task is to find such a way to do it. 
or find a way to do it. Just print the answer in form. Yeah, just print the path. Okay. The only line of input contains an integer n. Interesting. Alright, so let's illustrate. So we have an m by n grid. Let's make n equals 4. Oh, come on. Why does this happen now? My mouse just like stops giving input for a couple of, for a brief period of time. And it's kind of annoying because it makes gaps, and I don't like gaps because I have OCD. Okay, anyway, complaining. Yeah, we have this grid. And we want to find some path down from the top left corner to the bottom right, where we can only move down or right, as the problem says very clearly in the title. So what can we do here? In one query, we can ask the judge, we can, we can pick two cells, a starting cell and an ending cell, and we ask the judge if there exists a path such that from here we can get down here. Like for example, a path could be something like this, or like this, or like this. I think that's all the possible ones. Um, yeah, three, choose one, okay. <coughs> right, and so the problem is that some of these cells are blocked, for example, like, this cell could be blocked, in which case the only possible path would be this one. And if this cell is also blocked, then there's nothing, there's nothing we can do. So we, we can, and we don't know anything about the blocked cells. All we know is that we have an m by n grid. But we can ask these questions to try and figure out, like, what, what happens. Or, like, to try and figure out some sort of information. We only have 4n queries, and we have another constraint... Wait, four n queries, right? We have only four n queries, and we have another constraint that the Manhattan distance between the cells must be at least n minus one, which means Manhattan distance is essentially the column distance plus the row distance. In this case, it would be two plus two in total four, and um, the Manhattan distance must be at least n minus 1. That's what it is, right? Yeah, so... Um, let's see. So what that means is that, for example, like a query like this would be invalid because n is 4, and so that would be too short. So let's say we, like, didn't have this constraint. Let's again try and solve a simpler problem. What would we, what would we be able to do if we didn't have this constraint on Manhattan distance? Let's say we start here, then we want to figure out the path. And we know nothing so far. What we do know is that there exists some path. So let's say the path is like this, for example. And then, like, everything else is blocked or something, right? So, like, imagine for clarity, like, everything else is blocked. Then what we can do is we can ask from here, where from this position that we're currently at, where should we go next? And so what we can do is we can ask, for example, we can ask this cell to the end. Can we get from that cell to the end? And if so, then that means that there's some path from here to the end, because obviously we can get from here to here, um, I think. Yeah, because if this is no, then if it's a block cell, then it will be no automatically. So if we can get from here to here somehow, then that means that there's a path from here to the end, 
And because this isn't blocked, there's obviously a path from here to here, which means that if we go here, we're on the right track. But if we get a no, then that means that like the other one must be yes, otherwise there wouldn't be a path. So essentially, we can figure out like whether we can go in either direction, and we have to be able to go in at least one of them because there's there exists a path. So we can just figure out which direction to go in at each step. So for example, we would ask here. We would ask this cell to this one, and that's not possible because this is blocked. So we can like redundantly we can ask this one. Um, it doesn't really matter. Like either way, at most it'll take two queries. And then we would see that this path exists, so that'd be cool. And then we can keep going. From here, now that we move ourselves to here, we can do the same thing. We can ask here, and we can ask here. Now the problem is we do have this constraint on Manhattan distance. Which means that at a certain point, we won't be able to ask the queries anymore. Just because... Just because, like, there's no way to do anything. All right. So, essentially, there's a certain point from which we can't ask queries anymore. So, for example, this diagonal is very important because anywhere in this region, uh, Anywhere in this blue region, you can't ask a query for this one, for example. And why are my colors not changing? And everywhere in this green region, it's too close to the ending cell. Which means we kind of have like two separate halves that we're solving for. Um, But like, what's stopping us? Like, we have this, we have this strategy, where like, we can find some sort of path that lets us. Um, we can find some sort of path that like lets us do whatever we want. Why is this four times n? Can't we do it in two times n? Wait. Hmm. Yeah, well, we have some sort of path. But we can only extend this path to what the, to like something on this diagonal. But then we know that this path exists. And we can verify that this path will eventually lead us to the end because of the fact that like that's how the problem works. That's how the problem works because to verify that this path exists at every point we check that there's still some way to get to the end with this. The problem is we just can't get to the full end with it. But if we do the same thing going backwards, where we go here and then we ask for example over here, can we get from the start to here? And if so, then there's a path that like has this cell as the second last one. So we would do the same process, but going backwards using the beginning as a reference point. And so in a sense, because we can only solve half of the problem on one side of the diagonal, we split it into two halves and solve those two halves sort of like independently of each other. And then eventually we get this conjoined path that we can take to the end. Um, so that's like nice. Um, the only problem is somehow we have to verify that somehow we have to make it so like these intersect each other. Like these have to touch the same point. If we, if we for example, find some path that goes like this, then that's useless because these paths don't touch each other. So we don't have an answer. 
we have to make it so these paths are going to intersect each other at the same point. And one way we can do that is just by like forcing ourselves to go down a certain route. Let me get rid of these uh, scribbles because they're annoying. By forcing ourselves to go down a certain route. That is, here, we're going to try and find the lowest cell on this diagonal that still has a path. So for example, we'll try and find here. And if that doesn't work, we'll try here. And if that doesn't work, we'll try here. And if that doesn't work, we'll try here. And same for here. We can we can do that. Like we can try here, for example, and we can try here, and we can try here, and we can try here. And then whatever this diagonal is, we'll force ourselves to find it by just like doing this. <coughs> because both of them are trying to go for the lowest one. So how do we go for the lowest one? I think the way I think the best I think like, I think it just works if we first try going down and then going right. I, I don't think it's possible for us to have some sort of rabbit hole. Because, like, imagine there's some path such that, like, going right is the only way to get there. But, like, keep in mind we're working with a grid and it's kind of like a maze. So if such a path exists... Then if we go down and it's not possible... Like, if we go down, either there's no such path at all, or the only path that works is something that's higher. So if there's no such path at all, that's fine. We'll handle that case, because we're querying down anyway. Querying down anyway. But if the only such path goes sort of, like, of a, at a higher diagonal, just, like, look at this. Like, this point is an intersection. And this point has to be open because this path exists. So it's sort of like a contradiction that that's not possible because this path would exist. This is, of course, a very specific case, but I think it, it should generalize. Like if you have some sort of like connected component thing or something, like that's just got to be true. The hand along the wall idea. I'm not that familiar with that. Well, how would you use that? I think there's some other argument that also kind of uses continuity. Like, for example, um, say this is the thing you get when going right, and this is the thing you get when going left, or something. Then, like, in at some point when going right, you have to have gone down below this. And then, so whatever the path you get from going down, it's going to cross this line because its highest point is necessarily higher than this one. But when it crosses this line, then you can follow this path down. And this line may be staggered or whatnot, it may be like really weird, but it's still going to be a line. You can get out of a maze by putting your hand on the wall and just following it. Huh, as long as they're... Oh, I see how that would work. So you like do the right hand rule like here and then whatever you do, you'll have something. Okay, that makes sense. Smart. Smart as usual. Hmm. And then I guess it's like left hand rule or something if you do the same thing here. And of course, because we found this diagonal, we know there's a path here, then we know there's a path here. So if we do the same sort of thing down here, we'll get the same idea. So basically, first we start here, and we try and see if it's possible to go down. And if, it, if we can, then we do, otherwise we go to the right. And if it's possible to go down, then we try again. We keep trying to go down until it's not possible anymore, and eventually we'll get to some diagonal. 
And then here, we would do the same thing, except we would just try to go right or left first instead of down first, because we can only go left and up. And then I guess by the same argument, we'll find this lowest diagonal. Because a path has to exist through this, because we just verified that it did. And then sort of by either like right hand rule or other th other things about continuity or something, this works. So now implementing it should be simple, I guess. Um, read an n. Then. I'll use a deck for this. Actually, I can just use strings and then reverse the second one. So string, um, top, bottom. No, we should initialize those. Then, um, let's see. We ask the question. So this would be, might as well make this one and one. No need to zero index here. So it'd be r plus one c n and n. Oh, you don't have to do um, empty string. Is that because they're like objects and so it sort of does that automatically? Or like um, structs or whatever they are. I guess it would be the default constructor. It's kind of ors worthy. So if res plus plus r else plus plus c. Um, Yeah, that's true, I guess, like uh, empty vectors or something. Wait, what do we have to do? Down and right, right? I'm wondering if this is wrong. This feels like, I don't know. It's all, it's not using four end queries. It's only using two end queries. So is this is some sort of weird bound that I'm breaking, or is it just something that, like, is weird somehow? Um... We have to ask if it's possible to get from one. So first we try and go left. Oh wait. R. So then we go right here. Then we reverse bottom because these are the moves we did in reverse. Like we went from the end to the beginning. So essentially we do the two things separately, making sure we always go the lowest diagonal and then just go for it. That's a problem. Oh, I don't have that. That's a thing. Okay, now we have to do this somehow. So, um, oh wait, this is yes and no, not booleans.
All right, let's draw out some grid. Let's make it kind of hard, make it so there's only one path, and then we can try one with multiple paths and see if we still converge at the right point. Um, right, so let's do something like this. I can use the sample I had before. Okay. Now first, 4. Then we ask if we can get from 2, 1 to 4, 4. The answer is yes. We ask if we can get from 3, 1 to 4, 4. The answer is no. 3, 2 to 4, 4. The answer is no. So now we go the same route. 1, 1, 2, 4, and 3. The answer is no. So now we go up. From 3 to 3, the answer is yes. And from 3 to 2, the answer is no. So down, right, right. Down, R, down. Okay. Let's see. Try one more where the grid's like, like this, for example. Or actually, I'll do something like this. Yeah, so four, everything's chill. So yes, yes, no, and yes, yes, no. So down, down, R, down, R, R. Cool. I guess that would work. That does it. Okay. So we've only had stupid issues like printing, not printing the length or something. Or what, what happened here? Oh, because I was printing the wrong character. All right. Well, that does that. So this mashup is over. Um, yeah. That last one was cool. I feel like I could have included a harder problem to finish it off, but at the same time, like, just maybe not. It's probably fine if I don't. Let's see. So what else can I do now? I can make this go for like a bit longer, like another problem or something. There was some like requests in the, there, were, there was a request beforehand, right? That like IOI problem or something. Oh, the chat's gone. It, it was an IOI practice problem. It's not a real thing. 1375F, which one's that? Where's 1375? I'll binary search on this. 1375. Oh yeah, global round nine. Okay, okay. We shouldn't, <laughs> this round is the source of all like all of the constructors, but we shouldn't talk about global round nine. You, you wanna see how well I did on this one? This is how well I did. I got three problems and then died on D. So that was not fun. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on here, like this interactive thing. I don't want to resolve this. I'll talk about coins. Wait, there was a really cool actual IOI problem. Okay, if it's actually IOI, I probably can't do anything. Let's see. I have this already. Wait, 1375F is from Global Round 8? Wait, what? Isn't like 8 a different one? This one's like very different. 
Oh, so yeah, this one's this one this one's weird. This one, like, I don't know how you would like come up with this. I guess it's just like figure out better strategies, and then one of them just works. I don't know. Um, I want mushrooms. Okay, if we're doing actual IOI problems, maybe I'll save that for a better stream. I'll save it for a better stream where I haven't already spent three hours doing other things. Um, maybe when I have more time, I can stream like IOI practice or something. That could be, or not IOI, like Yusuko. That could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, Global Round 9. It's that like interactive um, something where you have to like play a game. Yeah, I've already had an experience with that problem, so it wouldn't be like the same thing. I don't know, this will be a shorter stream, I guess. I'll just, I'll talk about this one because this one's cool, and then I'll cut it off. So this one is, um, coins isn't very hard, or is it? It should work. Yeah, it's like it's like pretty quick. Although it's it's a cool constructive thing. I'll go over the premise. There are like a bunch of videos on this. Although I'm not sure how good I'm not sure how good they are at explaining like thought process and stuff. So I could try that. And also the subtasks themselves are interesting. So here's the idea. You have an eight by eight grid, which I'm going to steal from them, like so. You have an eight by eight grid, and essentially, each of these each of these grid cells have a coin on it. Either it's heads or tails. Um, like consider them like zeros or ones, and there are like two separate people. One of them knows that the one of them knows about a specific cursed cell. For example, like this one. But what he can. And he wants to like convey this to the second person. But the only thing they can do is they can pick K cells and then they can pick K cells, possibly like repeating ones. This is IOI practice. It's not an IOI problem. It's different. Day zero, you see. But basically, you can pick K cells and on each of these K cells, flip the state of the coin. It's like from head to, heads to tails or tails to heads. What you want to do is you want to convey to this other person the thing that it was. Yeah, you want to convey to this other you want to convey to this other person where the cursed cell is. Um So like what? How? How? Um, the subtasks are like, the subtasks are interesting. You have, so C is less than 2 and K equals 1, which means you have one flip. C is less than 3, K equals 1. So you have three possible cells in one flip. Um, you have K equals 64, which is kind of cool. You have K equals 8, and you have K equals 1. Now I lost my account on this, so I can't actually submit. But I'll go over this. I'll go over the solution. It's simple enough to write code for anyway. So for this one, for this subtask, it's kind of um, sort of simple. You can find the like just consider the first two coins. Either they're both heads. Either they're both heads. They're both tails, or like you have one of each. Those are there four possibilities. <clears throat> but in one move, you can only change one of the coins. So, like, one possible idea that you can do is you can make it so, like, you can say if the coins are the same, then it's zero. And if they're not the same, then it's one. And so you can sort of do it like that. And what that means is that, like in one move, you can change it from not you can change it from not the same to the same, and you can change it from the same to not the same. 
which means that in one flip you can cover both possible both possible um, states, which means that doing that would solve the first subtask. Now the second subtask is a bit harder because you have three things to represent. So the question is, how would you do that? And I'm actually not sure what the meaningful solution to this one would be. Is there something here that makes that's easier than other ones? Oh, you could do casework like on an entire row or something. Oh, you can do like something like the last one, maybe. Hmm. That would be a bit weirder, but I guess you can like just bash out some sort of solution where you consider like the first three or the first two or something. Okay. Well, anyway, that's fine. Um, K equals 64 is like kind of lame. Like basically you can, um, for K equals 64, you can basically like, with K equals 64, you can make the state of every coin whatever you want. Because like, say you want something to be heads. Either it's heads already, or you can make it heads with one flip. So, It's a bit like weird like that, but the idea basically is that like in this case, you can make it so like on with the subtask, you can make it so only the um, only the the cell with the cursed like only the cursed cell has, for example, heads and everything else is tails and that would work. With k equals 8, it's a bit more interesting. And this sort of motivates towards the intended solution slightly. Now you can sort of consider, like, notice you have 8 rows, right? So what if we, like, did something to each row to sort of convey a bit of information? With this subtask, we did something cool. We said something like, if, if, if we have an even number of things here, then... Actually, is there an easier solution for k equals 8, too? Like, we have 8 rows. So somehow we can figure out the row and the column it's on or something? Oh, that's smart. Yeah, okay, that's that's cool, actually. Yeah, with 8, okay, so it wouldn't exactly be like that. Okay, so it's separate. So with, with 8 things, you could... Um, with 8 things, you can, like, literally just... Because, again, you can change anything in whatever you want. So you could store... Like, C is 6 bits, so you could... For example, use these six things and, oh wait, two, it's two to the sixth, right? Yeah. So 64 is two to the sixth, which means you can use these six things and like write this number out in binary, which is kind of cool. I put the thing at the wrong place, but whatever. <laughs> what I was thinking for k equals eight, and I guess it's separate, is that like each row can be considered sort of individually and then
sort of like in each row, you could say, you could say, um, like for example, it's kind of the same idea as the first subtask. If you have an even number of, if you have an even number of bits set here, do something to the answer. Otherwise, do something else to the answer. And that's cool because within each row, with eight moves, you can control the parity of each row. So you can sort of write the binary in a different way, where you can say if you have an even number of bits in this row, include it in the binary, otherwise don't. So then this would be 2 to the 0, which is 1. This would represent 2 to the 1. This would be 2 to the 2, etc., up to 2 to the 5th. <laughs> and so that way you can control each bit with one move. But there's something even better you can do. And this is where you get k equals 1. Why limit ourselves to rows? With one move in this, in this representation, we can control a single bit and only a single bit. But why limit ourselves to only rows or only columns? Why not use both? Every number we have has a, dis has a distinct index from 0 to 63. Which means that, say we pick, um, say we pick 13, wait, is that a good example? Yeah, sure. Say we pick 13, for example. 13 in binary would be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Which means that in one move, we can alter, like, we can alter these three bits all at once by flipping 13. Mm -hmm. But notice that we have every possible number from 0 to 2 to the 6th, or 2 to the 6 minus 1. Which means that in one move, we can pick any subset of bits and alter all of them. Instead of just having one where we use a row, we do all bits at once because all of these, are bi all of these can be used as binary numbers in themselves. So what that means is that with a single flip, we can alter the bits to be whatever we want. And that's that's just it. With a single flip, we can convey whatever number we want because we can alter any subset of bits that we want, which includes 0, by the way, if it's already right. So basically what we would want to do is we would just want to alter the bits to make it so whatever this number is represents the cursed cell. And the easiest way to do that it's to just take the XOR of all of the possible, um, like if every, like take the XOR of the indices of all of the things that are heads, and then like let that be X, and then flipping a cell Y like if you, if you turn, if you turn it to heads and it wasn't heads, then you would get X XOR Y, and if it doesn't, then you would get like, like you would like inverse XOR Y. If it, if it, if this bit was turned if this number was like turned on, then you would get x x or y, and um, if it was turned off, then you would get like x with the inverse of x or of y. But the inverse of x or is just x or because x or is addition mod two. So what it really means is either way you get x x or y. So if the if the total like cumulative XOR of all the head ones is X and the current cursed cell is C, then what you would want to flip is X XOR C, which would make it so the XOR itself is X XOR X XOR C, which is just C, because XORs cancel each other out. Or like X XOR X is zero. And by the way, this symbol is XOR in like programming languages and stuff. So that means you can get any number you want. And that's the idea of this. It's it's kind of cool to think about subtasks like this. And this is why sometimes it's like it's an important thing to consider simpler problems. Because ideas for simpler problems or perhaps easier problems could very well extend into harder ones. Sometimes it doesn't. Like granted, sometimes it just completely fails and it's misleading. But if there's nothing, if you have nothing else, why not try? Can't hurt. 
and we extend this and we extend this idea of storing like even and odd with two things to this idea of using it for rows and also possibly storing the binary representation. And then here we realize that we have more control than we thought because we can alter all the bits at once. And yeah. That's the idea of this. It's a pretty cool problem. If only Iowa if only Iowa itself was as simple as this. Unfortunately it isn't. But okay, maybe we can have a constructive part two where we do like really hard ones and just try and bash my head against the wall for those. Who knows? That's how topic streams work. Um, it's always like a vote. So yeah, in terms of this, I'll just leave it. I have like nothing else to do. So that is cool. Um, Remember to join Second Thread Fan Club, which you can do by going to settings and then setting your um, setting your organization to this, and then you will be in Second Thread Fan Club, and it will be great. So you should definitely do that. It is a very important and fundamental thing. IOI 2020 connecting super trees. Hmm. Yeah, I may continue this. Okay. Well, I kind of wanted this stream to be shorter anyway because I have other things today to deal with. So, yeah, I'll leave this as is. We got through the mashup. That's good. There's still other things. I'll end the stream here. Um, hope you enjoyed slash learned something, maybe. Not sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to talk more, I'll be in this Discord. If you want, it's right there. Cool. Goodbye.